Throughout the course of human history, we found ourselves grappling with what has come to be known as the question of the day. In the 1500s, that question was, what happens when we go to the end of the ocean? What happens? Does the ocean go on and on forever, or does it? Do we fall off a cliff? What happens when we get to the end of the ocean? And it wasn't until Magellan and his crew decided in 1519 that they were going to answer that question. So three years later, his fleet came back, and they said, no, 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 no. The Earth is not flat. It's actually round. And if you continue to go on and on, you'll eventually come back to where you started from. And a more contemporary example, at the conclusion of the Civil War, the question of the North and the South was, what are we going to do with those individuals who were enslaved for all these years? What are we going to do with those people who were told when to wake up, when to go to sleep, when to eat, who to believe in, how to believe? What are we going to do with the Negro was the headline for the New York Times. And I always love one example of one story. General Sherman, who was in charge of this most eastern region of the South. General Sherman was talking to a group of slaves that followed his troops as they were going up and down the Atlantic coast. He said, what do you want us to do? What can we do for you all once this war is over? The slaves met and came back and said, General Sherman, if you give us our freedom, protect our freedom, then leave us alone. <laughs> give us our freedom, protect our freedom, and leave us alone. He said, sure, that's it? Not only will I do that, I'll give you all these old war mules, and I'll give you all the old Confederate land, I'll, I'll break it up into 40 acres, and I'll give you all 40 acres and a mule. In the 1960s, John F. Kennedy asked him to answer the question of the day, and John F. Kennedy told us, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country. So, so what's the question? What question are we going to let define us as a country? What question, what is our question? How can we make America great? I'll continue to you that our question is, how can we make America great? See, the president, when he was running, the president told us that we want to make America great. Again, he said, if you elect me president, I can make America great again. I said, OK, so, so what's wrong with America, Mr. President? He said, well, one, we're the most politically divided. We've been, this is the most divisive period in, in the politics of America. We have uncontrollable inner city violence. Our education is in ruins, and immigration is a huge issue. If you elect me president, I'll make America great again. And so I started thinking about these things. We are divided politically. Our politics are so divisive right now. But truthfully, our politics have always been divisive. The Federalists fought the Anti-Federalists. The Republicans have always fought the Democrats. And they weren't always smooth conversations sitting around tea. They were very divisive and very controversial. Barbara Holland wrote, not only did these men call each other regular names, they called each other fornicators, madmen, bastards. They accused each other of incest and treason. Our politics have always been divided. So Mr. President, when you talk about making our country great again, when are you referring to? So I agree, we, we have uncontrollable inner city violence. And, and, and we've done things to control that. We've done things to try to get around that, Mr. President. We, we've done things. We tried to control the message. We've censored gangster rap. We've gotten rid of Tupac and Biggie and, and NWA. We tried to censor these things already. Even under the Democrats' administration, we've cracked down on drugs. Bill Clinton helped introduce mandatory minimums that gave the different punishments for the same drug cooked different ways. So we've tried to work on these type of things already. But we have to eliminate these individuals who are fighting, they are quarreling, they are squabble over simple stuff. We've got to get them out. We have no place in our country for people like that. I, 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 I agree, Mr. President. I completely agree. However, I think it's important to, to know if we're going to make America great again, to know where we're going to look to. 
Are we going to look to our Vice President Aaron Burr and Alexander Hamilton, who decided to take it to the streets over political disputes, which resulted in the death of Alexander Hamilton? Or, or maybe we'll go to Randolph and Clay, who went to a duel because of an accusation over cheating, or Andrew Jackson and Charles Dickinson. Andrew Jackson and Dickinson fought and went to a duel because Jackson accused Dickinson of, Dickinson, Dickinson accused Jackson of cheating in a horse racing bet and talking about Jackson's wife. And even our beloved Mark Twain, he even was headed to a duel, which never happened, or we would never know who Tom Sawyer is. So we've always had these senseless acts of violence over crazy things, but, but education is an issue. And we do need to do things to reform our education system. However, when you want to make America great again, where do you want to look to? Should we look prior to the Civil War? Should we look to the point in history where only 13% of the white males were being formally educated, much less the minorities? Or do you want to go a little bit more recent? Let's go to Executive Order 11246, when Johnson said we want to introduce affirmative action in federal, uh, in federal, the federal government. You see, affirmative action has been great for minorities. It's allowed minorities to advance in education and economics and in leadership positions. And you know who's the largest beneficiary of that? It's white females. White females have, have advanced over affirmative action more so than any other minority group. So when you want to make America great again, are you saying before affirmative action? Because see, 53% of them are the reason you're in office, Mr. President. And then we'll go to immigration. <laughs> My president and his immigration talk. If we're going to talk about immigration, Mr. President, let's, let's talk about it from a true or historically correct, or historically correct perspective. America has a story past with immigration. <laughs> I'm not going to talk about the Native Americans, but I will tell you, in 1802, the America, America bought the land west of the Mississippi River. It's not a problem, right? But they bought the land west of the Mississippi River that was owned by the natives from the French. They bought the, North, they bought the Louisiana Purchase from the French. They bought their land from them, and now you want to put a wall around it. <laughs> Mr. President, to be honest, America's never been great. We can't make America great again. Well, you know what we can do? We can make America great. We can make America great by going to our forefathers, to the ideas before this country was ever a country. The ideas when they said, we want to hold these truths to be self-evident. And we believe that all men are created equal, and they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. And that are among these rights are life, liberty and the pursuit of happiness. If we go back to these ideas, we can make America great. We can make America great. And we can do this through cultural competency. We can do this through the appreciation of our differences. See, cultural competency is not just an understanding that we're different or understanding that things are not alike, but cultural competency is more of an appreciation. It understands that we're different, it respects our differences, and it appreciates our differences. It understands that that's what makes us great. Cultural competency in action. I'll give you three key ways we can do this. The first thing we can do is we can make our public service, public sector, public service is visible and accessible. I'm sorry. Visible and accessible. Recently, our Secretary of Education said she hasn't seen any evidence that free lunch helps people perform better academically. I can understand why. No IRB would allow a researcher to do a, to do a, a research project that attests that type of uh, question, Madam Secretary. Can you imagine asking the IRB, hey, I want to see how well students can do if they don't eat. You see, I'm a product of free lunch and reduced lunch. And some of my colleagues and peers, that's the only food that they know they're going to get on a routine basis. If we allow those two students, if we force them to go to school for seven hours a day and don't give them lunch or don't give them breakfast in some cases, some of those students won't eat. 
So the first thing we want to do is make our public, service, our public services accessible and visible. The second thing is we want to get rid of this one-size-fits-all deal. We want to understand that one-size-fits-all is not the way we are in America. We've never been that way. Let's get rid of that idea. This whole melting pot talk, we're not a melting pot. We don't want to be a melting pot. We've never been a melting pot. And let's understand and respect that. You see, I understand that you're Irish American or an Italian American. But I tend to side with W.B. Du Bois. I have a double consciousness in me. I'm always warring, two ideals warring. I am African and American. And I love being that. So let's understand this one size fits all does not work. And third and finally, we have to ensure that our public agencies rid themselves of cultural discomforts. In public administration, we call this representative bureaucracy. And it's a very simple concept, honestly. It's the concept that if there's a decision being made that affects a group or minority group, allow those minorities to sit at the table when making that decision. It's a very simple concept. You, I, I can imagine maternity leave with no mothers on the board discussing maternity leave. It's a very simple concept. So Mr. President, I'll tell you, we can't make America great again. And I tend to side with Langston Hughes, you know, America never was America to me. But Hughes went on to say, let America be America again. Let America be America again. Thank you.